Hello, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. We want to welcome you to the webinar on safer conception and pregnancy options for women and couples with HIV in resource-constrained settings, being hosted by FHI 360, USAID, and PEPFAR. We're really glad that you could join us today. Before we get started, my colleague Kathy is just going to walk us through a couple of logistics so that you can understand what's happening with the technology. Okay, now that the mic is on, let me try again. <laughs> Sorry about that. If you have external speakers or if you, your speakers have an external volume control, please adjust the volume for those devices. However, you may also need to adjust the volume by clicking the speaker icon on the lower right-hand side of your toolbar. Click and drag the volume up or down and make sure that mute is not selected. There will be two different views that you can choose when you're viewing the slide presentation. You can choose to stay in this initial view, which will have the presentation screen or pod, and a question and answer pod. This is the view that you're seeing now. You may also click the button that you see on the presentation pod that says full screen, if you would prefer to see a full screen view. This button will toggle you back and forth between full screen view and regular view. But note that if you're in the full screen view, you will not be able to see the question and answer pod. Although this is highly unlikely that you will have a freeze, if your computer should freeze up, try one of the following options to resolve the problem. Hit the refresh button in your web browser or toggle back and forth between full screen view and regular view or close the browser window and log back into the session using the URL that we emailed to you previously. There will be a time for questions after each presentation. We may not be able, we will not be able to take questions during the presentation for a couple of reasons. First, we don't want you to miss any information while you're trying to write questions and it would be impossible to keep the flow of the presentation going while also monitoring questions. When you do ask a question, you'll notice that there's a question and answer pod adjacent to the presentation pod. Simply type your question in the box at the bottom of the question and answer area and click the comment icon to submit your question. You will either receive a verbal response over your speakers or you may receive a written response in this area of the question and answer pod. Please keep in mind that we may not be able to answer every question but we'll try to answer as many as we can. The presentation will be monitored at all times. If you're having technical issues, please type a description of your problem into the question and answer pod and we'll do our best to resolve your issue. And we're looking forward to a great webinar experience. I'd like to Fantastic. Thank you, Kathy, very much for going over that with everyone. Again, I just want to take an opportunity to welcome you to today's webinar. My name is Tricia Petruni. I'm a senior technical officer in FHI 360's Global Health Population and Nutrition Group, and I'll be acting as your host and facilitator for today's event. This webinar was convened to help orient different groups of stakeholders to the various considerations for safer conception and pregnancy 
options for women and couples living with HIV, particularly in resource-constrained settings. We've invited three guest experts to share with us their brief thoughts in response to three burning questions, each of which relates to a different point, as you see here. First, what we know from the evidence about pregnancy desires and options for women and couples with HIV. Next, uh, the perspectives from women living with HIV about what they want and need with regard to safer conception and delivery from healthcare providers in the health system. And finally, some information about new fertility guidelines developed to support safer conception, including in resource-constrained settings. So the format for today is as follows. We'll first hear some opening remarks from a colleague at USAID, followed by some brief reflections and a general overview of the topic delivered by myself. Then I'll introduce each of our three guest experts as I pose their burning questions. I've given each expert about five minutes to respond. Our aim in keeping their collective remarks brief is to allow for um, substantial time for questions, comments, and hopefully an interactive discussion between the presenters and all of you. As such, I'm going to hold any participant questions until all three guests have finished. At that time, we should have at least 30 minutes for the Q&A and discussion. If you have any urgent questions during the presentation, please use your chat box as instructed by Kathy in the beginning of the webinar. And I'll start a queue and hold these questions or comments until the open discussion session. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce Ilana lapidos Salais, a Senior Technical Advisor for HIV Care, Treatment, and Support at USAID. Ilana also co-chairs the Care, Treatment, and Support Interagency Working Group. She's kindly going to get our conversation started today. And Ilana, the floor is all yours. Okay, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, my name is Ilana lapidos Elias, and I'm with USAID here in Washington. And um, I am on the Care and Support Technical Working Group, and our portfolio really serves to assure that across a continuum of care, we provide services for both the infected HIV um, adults and their families with services that aim at extending and optimizing quality of life for, for their families. And our services span across the five different um, broad areas, which are clinical, psychological, spiritual, social, and prevention. Now, under prevention, um, we have a spectrum of activities. And prevention counseling, um, pregnancy counseling, excuse me, is, is part of the wider package of these services that we do provide. And um, under this prevention messaging and services, um, we um, bear the mandate that all HIV-positive women who wish to have children should have access to safe and non-judgmental pregnancy counseling services. For the U.S. government on the whole, and um, that includes PEPFAR, we support a person's right to choose the number, timing, and spacing of their children, as well as use of family planning methods, regardless of HIV status. But we also, again, under the care and support portfolio, um, like to ensure that HIV positive individuals are provided with information and are able to exercise voluntary choices about their health, including their reproductive health. The decision to use or not use family planning is really their choice. And we um, advocate that this should be free of any discrimination, stigma, coercion, deceit, or any misinformation from you know, the health worker or, or any other service provider or community member. And that they should be provided with, you know, comprehensive um, um, information to various methods um, that they may access. We also support WHO um, in that the provision of voluntary um, family planning services, commodities, information, counseling, or referral to services should be part of an integrated package. Now, again, through PEPFAR, we are not able to provide all these services or commodities, but we do advocate to leverage from other programs. For example, USAID is able to provide some family planning um, commodities. Um, now, especially since because women um, of childbearing age account for more than 50% of the infected HIV population, again, under our Can Support portfolio, we like to ensure that women have access to integrated health services. And again, just stressing the fact that integrating voluntary family planning into our HIV services is key. Um, our prevention guidance, 
identifies various platforms um, through which uh, family planning um, and safe pregnancy counseling can be offered to ensure that clients are uh, either linked to or able to leverage these services. And so um, we use that platform in which to advocate and encourage and, and support family planning and safe pregnancy counseling. Furthermore, um, recently um, Secretary Hillary Clinton launched the blueprint, which, which also highlights the need to make an aids free generation a reality. USAID is committed to this, and through this blueprint we have um, the highlights that PEPFA will continue to leverage support for family planning commodities, again purchased from various different partners and to ensure that facilities that offer, for example, PMTCT also offer voluntary comprehensive family planning services to all women, again, regardless of their HIV status. Um, just before I end, I think um, just, just to emphasize the fact that safe pregnancy counseling is as much um, a conscious a contraceptive counseling for women living with HIV, and it really should be um, dependent on their choice and their desires, and that access to provision of, of health services, including antiretroviral treatment for HIV person, um, and family planning commodities and services should never be conditioned on the person's choice to accept or reject, such as family planning, um, and that we'd like to ensure that there is safe use of all these um, commodities in our PEPFAR programs. I hope everybody heard me. I think that is it for me. Um, if there are any questions, we will take them at the end. Okay, thank you so much, Alana, for those remarks. I think um, the support from USAID and PEPFAR that you've described um, is a perfect segue to a few opening um, remarks I'm going to share on um, the general topic. Uh, I think that as you described, any discussion of this topic should begin with a general but also important reminder that what we're discussing is really the right of all women to decide the number and spacing of their children, including women living with HIV. And deciding on the number and spacing of children naturally includes both pregnancy prevention and pregnancy planning. So it's this rights-based perspective that provides us with an important frame or context within which the more nuanced points will be dissected throughout this discussion. So I think most of you have probably noticed the growing global attention being paid to the reproductive health needs and rights of people living with HIV. Uh, those needs vary widely between individuals and couples. But with regard to fertility, generally fall along the lines of either A, preventing an unintended pregnancy and providing access to voluntary family planning and safe abortion services, or B, what planning a pregnancy entails from safer conception through to safe delivery and follow-up support. Now with regard to those two admittedly oversimplified ends of the fertility spectrum, a lot of participants are probably well aware that in recent years there's definitely been um, a distinct uptick in the global dialogue surrounding strengthening the linkages between family planning and HIV within policies, programs, and services. This has been a really critical development for helping the international community achieve progress toward meeting the reproductive health needs of women and couples with HIV, particularly those who wish to prevent a pregnancy. However, for the flip side of the coin, for women and couples who may wish to become pregnant, I think the discussion is too often narrowly focused on traditional prevention of mother-to-child transmission services, meaning serving women once they are already pregnant. I believe this narrowed focus really belies a large gap in services or attention being paid to women and couples who need information and services on fertility decisions before becoming pregnant. There are a number of challenges related to pregnancy desire and making informed decisions that people face, which include but are not limited to uh, low rates of HIV testing and knowledge of one or both partners HIV status the lack of access to both information and high quality services, 
about the options for safer conception, pregnancy, and delivery. Um, sometimes severe stigma coming from healthcare providers who have been widely reported to instruct people living with HIV to avoid having children, or even in the absence of direct stigma being served by providers who simply have not been adequately trained and do not have the skills or knowledge to provide comprehensive services. And finally, I think one of the barriers for providing better services is the fairly limited evidence base about not only what women want and need, but which models and approaches might be best to address these needs. Fortunately, the evidence base uh, continues to expand. The journal Reproductive Health Matters recently published a supplement last year dedicated to the topic of pregnancy decisions of women living with HIV. The evidence within this supplement and combined with findings from additional studies in the literature and also with program experiences on the ground and lessons learned from those is really helping us to continue to better understand the issues and the way forward. So today we're going to explore more about what we know, how what we know might be applied and utilized, and also a little bit about what we might not currently know. So on that note, I'm really happy to introduce our first guest expert, Lisa Messersmith, who is going to get our discussion started. Dr. Messersmith is currently Associate Professor of International Health at Boston University's School of Public Health and Associate Professor of Anthropology at Boston University's College of Arts and Sciences. And importantly, she was also a contributor to the Reproductive Health Matters Journal Supplement that I just mentioned. So I'm very pleased to hand it over to Lisa to answer today's first burning question, which is what do we currently know about the pregnancy decisions of women living with HIV and the options available for safer conception and delivery? And what are some of the remaining knowledge gaps? So Lisa, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Tricia, for your introduction and for your invitation to um, talk today about uh, this particular burning question. My remarks today will focus on uh, some of the um, behavioral, structural, and social factors rather than clinical factors um, regarding safer conception and pregnancy options for women and couples living with HIV. So. I've been asked to talk about um, what do we know from the evidence about pregnancy decisions of women living with HIV and options available for safer conception delivery. Um, I'd like to start out by saying, as, as I think has been highlighted before by Tricia, that um, regardless of HIV status, um, desire for children can be affected by a range of factors and circumstances, including number of living children, family size norms, cultural values, wishes to fulfill fertility expectations once married, and other uh, social factors uh, and personal factors. But living with HIV adds an additional dimension on making a decision um, about uh, having children. Uh, fortunately, we know that access to highly active antiretroviral therapy has turned HIV into a chronic disease, one that can be managed with appropriate care and treatment and, and with which one can live a healthy and productive life. People living with HIV may make reproductive health choices based on improved health and well-being, including ability to work and be active in the communities, all activities which are enabled by access to treatment. Safe conception is possible. I think we're going to hear more about that um, in resource-constrained settings. Um, for example, we know that those on heart are much less likely to transmit HIV to their partners because of uh, lower viral loads than those who are not on treatment. We also know that an HIV-negative partner can reduce the chances of HIV infection if on heart for pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. Now, in terms of um, actual pregnancy and postpartum, um, a significant challenge is really getting individuals and couples to get tested and ensuring that they get the results, enroll and remain in care. But we know that only about 35% of pregnant women in low and middle income countries are tested for HIV. Pregnant women with CD4 counts less than 350 are more likely to transmit HIV to their babies than those with CD4 counts above 350. 
We know that PMTCT, or prevention of mother-to-child transmission, is highly effective at reducing the likelihood of mother-to-child transmission from a likelihood of 35% down to 5% or lower. And PM, sorry, PMTCT can also serve as a gateway to connect women to other services, such as reproductive health or primary health care. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, I'll talk about this a little later. Um, and the WHO, as you know, has issued um, new guidelines for PMTCT. Um, each country is deciding what option they're uh, going to follow, whether it's option A, B, or now we have the option of B+. Um, heart during pregnancy is associated with stronger immune systems, decreased risk of HIV-related morbidity, and reduced maternal mortality. And access to PMTCT services has improved dramatically over the last five years, yet the proportion of ART-eligible pregnant women who receive ART for PMTCT ranges from a low of 4% in North Africa and the Middle East to, uh, sorry, yeah, to 79% in Europe. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there are very high rates of loss to follow up after HIV testing regardless of CD4 count, and that's in men and women living with HIV. So, and further, that retention in care um, once diagnosed is also very difficult uh, and a huge challenge. Uh, for pregnant women, this involves all the steps in the PMTCT cascade. Even getting women into the ANC clinic to be tested is the first place we lose women. Um, being offered the test, agreeing to take the test, coming back for the results, being enrolled in ART or pre-ART care, accepting and taking the drugs, adhering to the ART regimen, um, having a safe delivery, um, and, and ensuring that they give the appropriate regimens to their babies, and then practicing safe feeding practices. Um, women are lost at every step along this way. Um, so th these, this is a major issue. Um, but little attention is paid also to linking HIV-positive women to long-term care and treatment for their own health. Another major challenge <clears throat> is adherence to ART for women who need to be on heart for their own health. Lack of adherence, as we know, has consequences for mothers and babies and may lead to drug resistance. And I want to say just a little something about stigma and violence on an individual level for women. Um, that stigma and violence against women with HIV has been reported in, in many countries and often the reasons why women are not tested um, and the reasons why they are lost during the PMTCT cascade of care. Other barriers <clears throat> include lack of continuity of care, gaps in the referral process, the need to strengthen linkages, cost of services for many women, and the high mobility of some populations of women. On a structural level, there are many issues. Um, first, there are, um, not all countries are able to provide ART on a continuous, uninterrupted basis, and some face serious drug stockouts. Sustainability of a supply of ARTs is uncertain given the global economic situation. The rollout and sustainability of option B plus presents additional challenges. The focus on PMTCT has often resulted in limited attention and services to address the health and social service needs of women for their own health and well-being, including their initiation on heart and long-term care and treatment. <clears throat> There's also still a lack of a comprehensive sexual health approach that includes sexuality and informs sexual health decision-making through the life cycle and addresses such issues as gender-based violence. Lack of linkages, referral mechanisms, and integration with other health and social services, including ANC, HIV, reproductive health, gender-based violence, and economic strengthening services makes it difficult for women and couples to navigate the diverse set of systems and obtain the services they need. I'd like to say just a few words here about stigma and discrimination. Tricia mentioned that as, a, as an important issue. Um, we know that stigma and discrimination in the community impact individual and couple decision making, but they also impact provider attitudes and the ability of health services to meet the reproductive health needs of people living with HIV. 
Simply being sexually active is often contested by partners, friends, family members, and healthcare providers, many believing that people living with HIV should not engage in sexual behavior for fear of infecting others. A decision to have a child is similarly challenged, with many family members, friends, and healthcare providers again advising against having children for fear of transmitting HIV to the baby and creating orphans. Healthcare provider attitudes regarding sexual behavior and reproductive health affect women's health, women and couples' healthcare seeking behavior before, during, and after pregnancy. Studies in a number of countries have documented advice from providers to be sexually abs abstinent and pressure to contracept or abort when a woman wants, wants children, as well as some cases of coerced uh, sterilization. And further, there are laws and pending laws that criminalize HIV transmission, including mother-to-child transmission, which may pose additional concerns for people living with HIV regarding their reproductive health decision making. Now, what ga knowledge gaps remain? Um, there are a number. I just want to highlight a few. Um, <clears throat> most of the literature focuses on prevention of vertical transmission. And significant gaps remain regarding how best to meet the sexual and reproductive health needs of women and couples living with HIV. How can technology, for example, such as assisted reproductive technologies, help to meet these needs and be affordable and accessible? We know very little about the reproductive health decision making and rights of women and men from marginalized or disadvantaged populations. Are some populations at a dis disadvantage when seeking reproductive health information and services? For example, do sex workers and drug users have equal access to ANC, PMTCT, and HIV treatment services? And what about migrants or displaced persons or those living in conflict settings? We know very little about the challenges faced by adolescents living with HIV, many who were infected at birth and who are becoming sexually active. Despite the desire of individuals and couples living with HIV to have children and the availability of ART in many settings, why do some healthcare providers and family members continue to advise HIV positive individuals and couples to be sexually abstinent, use contraception, and simply just not have children? How, are, how effective are efforts to address stigma and discrimination in the health sector and the community? What can be done on interpersonal, programs, systems, and societal levels to improve HIV testing, retention, and the continuum of care, and adherence to ART for women and couples and their children? How effective is peer support and community empowerment in improving retention and adherence? Is the use of technology effective in resource-constrained settings? Rigorous studies are badly needed to compare the health outcomes of those in integrated uh, versus non-integrated programs. How effective are integrated compared to standalone services? What services should ideally be included in an integrated program? And what are the changes that need to take place in health systems to enable better linkages and integration? And what needs to happen at the level of donor policies to enable this kind of integration? While we know that people living with HIV in the developed world report higher prevalence of depression and other mental health problems than those living with HIV, we don't know much about the causes and consequences of mental health issues faced by pregnant and postpartum HIV positive women in resource constrained settings. Finally, what are the impacts of laws and pending laws that criminalize HIV transmission on the reproductive health decision making and care seeking behavior among women and couples living with HIV? What is the role of the health sector in addressing these issues? And finally, in closing, the global community's goal to eliminate transmission of HIV to children and to keep mothers alive needs to build on existing successes in treatment and PMTCT, protect the rights and ensure the meaningful involvement of women and couples living with HIV, and address individual structural and social factors that impede access to services and retention in care and treatment. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. I think that your comments really highlight a number of important points that are going to set the stage for some rich discussion um, a little bit later. I think one of the fundamental points that you raised that's really important is you know, the, the fortunate reality that HIV is really becoming a chronic disease with effective treatment prolonging active, health, active and healthy lives of people which I think um, probably has an effect on how HIV-positive couples 
um, make choices about, about having more children. Um, and I think this includes both effective treatment for adults, but also with increasing uh, access to PMTCP, making the potential for an HIV-free birth more likely than ever before. Um, I also think that um, your points about strengthening the cascade of care are really important and ensuring we aren't losing women along the way and improving retention and adherence, you know, this is a really critically important component of helping women and couples successfully achieve their fertility intentions, whatever those might be. So in thinking further about what kinds of support uh, these women and couples uh, want and need, I'm happy to introduce our next guest expert, Ms. Promise Misembu, also a contributor to the Reproductive Health Matters Journal Supplement. Promise is currently working with the International Community of Women Living with HIV-AIDS as a Global Advocacy Officer for Sexual and Reproductive Rights. Promise will kindly address our second burning question, which is what types of information, support, and services uh, do women living with HIV want and need from healthcare facilities with regard to making fertility decisions and achieving their fertility goals, particularly with regard to planning a pregnancy and safer conception? So promise, I'll turn it over to you. coordinate ICW uh, programs in Southern Africa uh, on an acting you know, basis. Um, I, I've been asked uh, to talk today uh, about what types of information uh, do women with HIV want uh, from healthcare facilities with regard to fertility decisions. Um, you know, most of what I was going to say is actually being covered by the two presentations uh, before me. Uh, I mean, which is great because it, you know it means that we we coming from the same you know base. We, we believe in, in similar things, um, you know. But for me, the starting point really <clears throat> is to view reproduction of HIV positive women as a right, um, you know, as opposed to a mistake and or a favor. Um, I mean, reproduction is a right for all women, and I think that should be you know afforded to HIV positive uh, women as well. I mean, the previous speakers have highlighted the fact that um, <clears throat> uh, women with HIV express, you know, reproductive desires or fertility as, as desires, um, and research, you know, sort of confirms, you know, this fact. Um, and what is, you know, interesting for me in terms of this research is that um, reproductive or fertility desires are there, whether HIV medication was there, and also in the time uh, of HIV uh, medication. Um, what is also important to me in terms of fertility desires is that uh, the social drivers uh, of reproduction in HIV positive men is actually uh, the same uh, as those uh, of women in their same, uh, you know, socio-economic status, and, and I thought that was uh, very interesting. Uh, you know, so HIV positive women, you know, from where I'm seated, are, you know, reproductive, as, you know, beings, and I think the starting point for me is to respect that and draw that uh, in, in, in mind. Um, you know, and I think um, you know this fact has to be considered uh, when uh, we are treating women, uh, particularly of reproductive age. Um, at this point in time, uh, when I look at programs, I see them as being reactive, you know, to a mistake. She fell pregnant because she did not know her HIV status. She was tested uh, in, in pregnancy. She has had her uh, what they call PMTCT baby, and she can't quite have you know another uh, PMTCT. Uh, baby. Uh, we see that when, uh, you know, ARD medications are given to women, for instance, you know, they sort of apply the one size fits all, um, you know, where fetal regimes are just given to everybody. And when a woman falls pregnant, you know, then the system panics and it changes her medication. You know, our view is that if she is a woman and she is of reproductive age, her, treat her treatment needs should be, you know, presented such that they met they, 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 they match, you know, the fact that she might fall pregnant uh, during the course uh, of her taking an uh, IRV medication. So the system has to be, you know, proactive rather than reactive, uh, really. Um, and, uh, I mean, our concern uh, has also been the fact that, uh, I mean, there is very little that has been done in terms of making sure that she conceives uh, safely because she's not expected to have a child uh, in the first uh, place. 
um, and when she is pregnant, the focus has been on the baby. Um, and this is a concern for us, and it also raises an ethical question because we've made strides in relation to prevention of mother to child transmission, even in resort poor uh, settings. But with the decrease uh, of, of prevention of mother to trans transmission or vertical transmission, we've seen a sharp increase of maternal mortality in HIV positive women. You know, and this is you know sort of bearing as evidence, you know, as the fact that you can't quite be looking after the baby and leaving the the the, the, the mother the mother you know aside. The two have to be taken care of at, 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 at together. Um, and uh, you know, it, it remains you know like a deep concern of ours because I mean many PMTCT programs um, are now expanded, uh, at least on paper, such that they include uh, include uh, the, the, the mothers, but the mothers are still dying. And we hear that, I mean, in some countries, I mean, particularly in this region in Southern Africa, other countries still cannot uh, afford keep, to keep the mothers uh, in treatment beyond pregnancy. And this might be contributing to high maternal mortality. You know, and, 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 and this, I, I think, you know, speaks to us needing to do more work to ensure that access to treatment is expanded, but from the maternal mortality, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, frame uh, as well. Um, there's been a lot of talk uh, about expanding contraceptives to, to HIV positive women, um, you know, because it is thought that if HIV positive women are able to plan their pregnancy, you know, the rate of mortality, you know, will be less and also the rate of HIV infection to the babies will also uh, be, be less. Um, and we obviously support these initiatives, you know, but there are a couple of things that one could put on the table, you know, to say, that women living with HIV should not be separated from the context in which they live in. Uh, in this particular region, the uptake for contraceptives um, in the average is 35%. You know, and we feel that it is, you know, a bit unfair and it's putting pressure and it increases stigma on HIV positive women if they are expected, you know, to be living beyond, you know, the, the average because they are part of these societies. If societies cannot um, access or up, you know, take contraceptives because of whatever reason, why then is the society expecting HIV positive women to be able to, to do this? You know, and to say, you know, that the 35% is not something that is coming, you know, that is created by the women, it's something that is systematic. You know, so the approach for us would be expand uh, contraceptive access to all women, because if we expand it to all women, women living with HIV would, would then benefit, you know, address all the structural issues that prohibit women from using contraceptives. In that way, HIV-positive women would benefit uh, from that as well. We don't want HIV-positive women to be singled out, um, you know, on issues uh, of contraceptives. Um, and there are issues um, in the sense that, um, I mean, from where I, see, I am seated, um, and, 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 you know, based on my experience, there isn't like a clear guideline or a clear knowledge as to how contraceptives interact with HIV infection and also interact with antiretroviral drugs. Um, you know, so the women who are getting contraceptives are getting contraceptives with the hope, you know, that they will work and that they will be safe um, uh, uh, to, to use, you know, but there is no sort of documented information that is there to support that particular cause. Um, I have been, you know, interacting, interacting with credible uh, research in institutions uh, in the country. I, I mention them because, you know, the information is out there in the public domain, Caprisa. They seem to be thinking that Depo-Provera, which is a popular contraceptive that is used in this particular region, might have something to do with faster disease progression in HIV-positive women. And this raises, you know, concerns like in terms of ethics and in terms of the rights of HIV-positive women. We are also acutely aware that some HIV-positive women have reported being, uh, you know, coerced or forced into taking contraceptives. Uh, you know, and obviously the popular one is Depo-Provera. Uh, for an example, women would say, I take my ARVs in the clinic, but before I get a script for ARVs, I have to prove that I've taken, I've taken my depot shot, otherwise I'm not going to get you know, that, that particular you know, script. You know, so it, for me, it's two issues. It's the issue uh, of choice uh, for this particular you know, woman, and it's the issue of placing conditionality to ARV, um, uh, 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 to access to ARV medication. And it's also you know, the issue of the fact that why would you give something that is going to harm the women. Why would we want to make gains in relation to uh, family planning 
but also you know reduce that the, the, the women's uh, opportunity you know to leave how do we you know match the two and come with up with a compromise that is going to to work at for all um you know and, and basically what this means is that you know the contraceptive debate you know as it is you know the fact that they are lack um of uh, what are they called? Commodities. Uh, the lack of uh, options, you know, policies are also lacking, and resources to finance these are also lacking. So it sort of impacts uh, on HIV positive women. And we believe that if we address this, we have to look at the whole contraceptive policy of the country to say what is available and what can be available and what is safe, you know, and what can be made, uh, you know, safer. And how do we ensure that all women, including HIV positive women, actually have the access to stay credible and ethically sound and contra uh, 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 um uh, I, I, and i also think like as a recommendation going forward um that i mean aid programs you know as you know they are uh, they need to be you know starting to think about uh, testing women for hiv before they are pregnant you know because i think the complications that we have, you know, particularly because that HIV testing is concentrated in, in pregnancy. Because if women are tested before they are pregnant, they are therefore, you know, in a better position to plan for their pregnancy, you know, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the rates that will come with uh, HIV uh, 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 infection. Um, I mean, a couple of years ago, there were talk uh, about safe, uh, safe perception, you know, techniques to assist HIV positive women to uh, conceive, you know, safely. But if you raise these issues in this part of the world, um, you know, you are seen as someone who is close to being insane, you know, because there are so many other uh, what are, you know, perceived to be valid and legitimate uh, healthcare, uh, you know, priorities. And this is, you know, just not one of them. You know, and the same, you know, sort of, you know, conversation about safe conceptions. Um, you know, other women were reporting that they are not conceiving although they are not using, you know, any method, you know, and the question was, you know, does HIV affect one's fertility, you know, and if the answer is yes, uh, which is what the literature seems to be suggesting, what do we do about that? I mean, do we want to uh, protect the, the rights of women to fertility in a size that affects, you know, her children, or we also want to encourage and promote, you know, that right? And from my perspective, promoting that right will also pro to provide fertility service services to um, uh, HIV uh, positive women. Um, stigma and discrimination has been mentioned uh, uh, as an issue that affects HIV positive women in this area. Um, that HIV positive women are discouraged from having children. Um, you know, and, and from my perspective, this is applicable to all uh, poor women. Uh, and the question is how, I mean, do we deal with this particular issue? Because if there is an attitude, if you are not uh, allowed to reproduce, the problems are not necessarily going to respond favorably uh, to you. Um, we've had uh, issues of uh, forced contraceptive. Um, I mean, here uh, in the region, I've mentioned those earlier. And we've also had issues of forced and coerced uh, sterilization of HIV positive women. You know, it's coming from this whole you know, idea that positive women should not be having further uh, children. And we've also you know, had issues of you know, women being, you know, sort of punished for, for falling pregnant if they know their HIV status. For an example, being expelled uh, from AIDS uh, organization. We know that in one country, Southern Africa, there's, you know, even a written policy from non governmental organization to the effect that if you are a woman and you live with HIV and you fall pregnant knowing your HIV status, then you should be expelled mm -hmm. from an organization, whether you are an employee or just a member uh, of the organization. You know, so attitudes against the reproduction of HIV positive women are, 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 are great. Um, and from my perspective, these are, you know, sort of human rights, you know, violation in their nature. Uh, but the other concern I have is that these tend to push women away from the public health care services. You know, women no longer, you know, go to seek uh, health services because uh, of this particular attitude uh, and violation. And I think uh, we need uh, to do something uh, uh, about that. Um, and in moving forward, um, I think we need to think carefully about you know, human rights programming uh, as we talk about integrating of sexual and reproductive health, particularly contraceptives, into the uh, HIV uh, agenda. And I think there is a need for a deeper dialogue be between HIV positive women and healthcare uh, service providers 
and I also think that there is a need, uh, you know, for further research into contraceptive uh, fertility and HIV positive women. So that's where I'll end my intervention for now. Hello. Oh no. Hello. Yes. Thank you. Promise very much. Okay. Thanks. I thought I was talking to myself. <laughs> Hello? No, definitely not. We, we, we heard you and, um, and I think all of your comments are, are really great. For me, uh, you know, a, a couple of points raised that deserve to be flagged. Um, you, you know, one of your first uh, points, I think, is really pointing out a, a positive trend, I think, where historically um, uh, pregnant women living with HIV, for them the focus in healthcare settings has really been on the baby. But I think in recent years that's fortunately been changing, um, which is quite clear in the new framework, eliminating new HIV infections among children by 2015 and keeping their mothers alive. Mm -hmm. I think that latter part, again, is indicative of a real positive shift in focus from not um, simply preventing mother-to-child transmission, but to ensuring healthy lives for both the child and the mother after delivery. Um, also, you raised the point of you know instances of coercive services like linking ARV access to family planning use, which means I think that we have a lot of work to do to ensure that HIV-positive women are receiving comprehensive health services with full respect for their choices and rights. Um, and this issue of service delivery is closely linked to our third and final burning question. <clears throat> um, and for this question, we have none other than Linda Gale Becker, the Deputy Director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center at the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town, and Chief Operating Officer of the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation. Uh, also, as a committee co-chair in the Southern African HIV Clinician Society, Linda Gale will be providing us with some additional information on the recent guidelines drafted by the Clinician Society. Um, so, Linda, hand it, Linda Gale, hand it over. Great. Thanks, Tricia. Um, I just check that I'm being heard loud and clear. Um, and, of course, thanks to FHI 360 for this opportunity to present the Southern African HIV Clinician Society guidelines on safer conception. And, um, and of course, everything I've heard this afternoon resonates with the reason why those guidelines were formulated and why, indeed, there is still a great deal of work to be done. But I think they definitely do move us in the direction that we hope to go. And I've put just a few slides together, first of all, um, to make sure that people have the reference. Um, so this is the Southern African HIV Journal uh, that you can look up online. And it, uh, this particular guideline was presented in Volume 12 of 2011. So if you go online and log in, uh, you are actually able to get the guidelines. So that, that is the, the reference. Guidelines in the Southern African HIV Clinician Society, it must be said, is not an exhaustive um, uh, process, much as you would hear when you see the treatment guidelines put out by the DHHS or the guidelines put out by BEVA or any of these large organizations. This generally is a consensus document put together by practitioners in the field from resource-limited settings, and they really do try to answer on-the-ground practical requirements. And, and this is really what drove uh, these guidelines. Viv Black and myself chaired a committee of concerned practitioners, including the voices of uh, um, that we had heard of women living with HIV and, and their needs. And we recognize that even though resources are limited in many settings and we're not able, perhaps, to present the full menu, it really was and is our requirement to um, increase uh, knowledge around how uh, contraception, family planning, and conception can actually pre be presented to uh, individuals and couples 
so that they can uh, safely conceive or safely prevent conception uh, in such a way that their own health uh, and the health of those they love and are in relationships can be considered. So in the next slide, you see some of the ethical considerations that were considered and we read widely. Um, the HIV, we use this terminology of the HIV-infected non-infertile couples um, who are able to uh, reproduce would be considered. The reason, and I say this to promise in particular, the reason we did not go with the, um, with the infertile individual or couple is that that already has enormous ethical uh, considerations outside of HIV. So this is a very expensive consideration, and we know already it doesn't matter what your HIV status is, this is very limited to a small percentage of the population who are able to afford it in this part of the world. So we decided to really try and address our guidelines to the broader community. We would consider HIV status and then consider the non-infertile. So in other words, uh, couples who are able um, to have uh, to have children in order to uh, take this forward. So if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see what the guidelines actually consist of. Um, and everyone has said this, and we really want to bring this home, and part of the guideline uh, motivation is really to increase the consciousness of practitioners in this part of the world around these issues. And, and Tricia, I absolutely agree with you. I've been in the business for a long time, and I remember like yesterday, that we, you know, we were really, and I, I have to say, in the early days when we were rationing antiretrovirals and only very small parts of our population were actually able to get antiretrovirals, there was a very strong belief that, you know, we needed to limit who was having sex with whom. And, and I, you know, I think that is a well-known fact and it was out there. However, with universal access of antiretrovirals, with the change in the whole uh, epidemic to that of a chronic illness that people live longer with HIV than they do with many other conditions, that we really do have to rethink this. And this, I think, is, is really what the guidelines are about, is bringing out this consciousness uh, that people have reproductive choices. There are people and couples who do not want children. And promise I fully agree with you that we need more contraceptive choices. We need more research to know what is safe and what isn't. But in the meantime, we should absolutely increase uh, the choices that we present to people. And I'm pleased to say I think there is some move in our country. The Department of Health in South Africa has pushed this, that there needs to be a wider, a widening of choices around, anti, uh, around uh, contraception. And I'm pleased to say that actually it's the HIV infected community, fraternity, healthcare, whatever you want to call it, that is driving this, um, this agenda. And so even in this province, the place we are starting at, at the public sector, of increasing contraceptive choices are actually within our HIV clinics. So I know that IUDs are being introduced uh, and other you know, possibilities are being considered. So uh, this is a, an awakening to the need that we do need to also enable people to make contraceptive choices. Then there's the couple who presents post-conception. To my mind, this is um, in a way a failed um, guideline interaction, if you like. What we really try and push in the guidelines is that this should be a conversation on a regular basis with people attending clinics. So on every time a woman presents at a clinic and she's in the reproductive age, she should be asked what her, her position is in, the, in a non-judgmental, non-prejudicial way. So that because people's views also change. It's not a tick box that we make it, you know, on day one when they screen for their antiretrovirals and then we don't talk to them ever again about this. This is something that needs to be raised on a regular basis. And we really do want to catch the couple or the individual preconception so that we, we really do present options and we do really make sure that we have the safest um, scenarios for both uh, parties involved as well as the ultimate baby that is born. So um, obviously there is the couple who want a child. Uh, there is the need for preconception counseling and 
uh, clearly we, we lay out in the guidelines what should go into that. Also the preconception assessment, what is the health status of both individuals who may be involved here. We really do push very hard that there should be couple counselling in this if at all possible, but we also do recognise that there will be women who will present who may not have a couple around um, or, or a partner available to come and talk at the clinic and we try to uh, guide the practitioner through how to deal with that as well. Um, and then obviously there's management of all kinds of couples um, and in the next slide I try to uh, raise the, the notion, I think it is in the next slide, um, no, so I just outline and, and you can read this um, in your own time or go to the, the guidelines, there's the, some of the detail that we go into in the preconception counselling uh, that I think is, is really important. I raise in the last point reproductive techniques like sperm washing with intrauterine inser insemination and so on will obviously only be available at certain uh, levels of care and in certain centres. So the other thing that our guideline does, which I think is pertinent to a resource constrained setting, is we do uh, interrogate different levels of care. We recognize there's primary health care where even sperm washing won't be available. We, we may be able to provide antiretrovirals and good counseling and condoms and a syringe to do some uh, sperm transfer intravaginal insemination, if you like, and that's about it. Um, to an up referral for sperm washing in a positive male, should that be a scenario, uh, to the full-on infertility services that may exist for some individuals. And so we try to present those scenarios and give people options so that whatever the, the scenario setting, resource setting they find themselves in, they recognize that there are options even for their setting. Um, and, you know, there is a lot that can be done even without the fancy um, uh, fertility type reproductive techniques that we are seeing in the first world or in, in richer scenarios. In the next slide, I think this is probably every, something that everybody knows, but again in the guidelines we go through in a kind of matrix way recognition that there will be an infected female partner or there may be um, and, and a discordant uninfected male, there may be an infected male with a discordant uninfected woman, or indeed there may be concordant seropositivity. And as I say, in the matrix way, we then go, well, what happens in resource poor and what happens in resource uh, better off, as it were, and, and really do try and present a pragmatic approach for everyone so that um, at the end of the day, we have the least risk uh, and the safest scenario uh, that we can present for anyone. And I, I, I'm sure you can imagine there was a great deal of conversation that went into uh, making these guidelines, and everybody in the room wore their pragmatic hat uh, for this to say, well, what is on the ground today? What is the reality? There is obviously that which we reach for and we hope for, but what is actually on the ground today? And, and I hope that as people read that, that they will see that coming through. So I acknowledge Viv Black, who was a fabulous co-chair, um, a wonderful committee that helped us formulate this, and I pay a tribute to the South African HIV Clinician Society that I think is not frightened to deal with controversial issues, uh, but to make sure that we do move towards uh, the best care that we can despite limited resources the best care that we can for the, the members of the public that we serve. So I'll stop there and leave more time for questions. I will just say one more thing, Trisha, if I may. In the guidelines, um, and I encourage people to go and look, we've, we've actually put a few case studies, which I think gives it an interesting um, sort of twist. And we've presented those case studies, recognizing again we are appealing to practitioners, nurses, doctors, counselors, who, who are grappling with these questions and these scenarios every day of their working lives. And by actually going through some case studies, you know, we try to present real life uh, situations. We would value feedback from anybody. 
Um, and life guidelines are all around the world. These actually probably need to be updated. Uh, we are talking about and promise, or in fact, I think it was Lisa who raised the question of the adolescent um, uh, individual who also lives with HIV and we are certainly hoping to add a section or update the guidelines and bring in a section around adolescents in particular. So um, any comments would be greatly valued, I'm sure. Thanks, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Linda Gale. I think that your um, description of these guidelines is hopefully going to generate a lot of interest in them. And so I think what I'd like to do as we move into the open question and answer session, where I can now welcome people to use your Q&A chat box in that bottom white line of your screen. If you'd like to submit a question, you can do so now. So as people are, are maybe formulating and submitting their questions, I'm wondering if, Linda Gale, you'd be willing to um, share with us what the, the sort of status is of these guidelines on the ground. And I'm sort of personally curious to know what um, countries they're, they're being used in um, and maybe what the status is of, of being implemented and rolled out. So if you'd be willing to perhaps tell us a little bit more about that as we wait for some questions to come in, that would be great. So yes, thanks Trisha. I'm afraid we don't have a sort of brilliant m and &E system where we can tell you how many people have downloaded the guidelines and who's actually using them in the field. What I can tell you is that uh, the Southern African HIV Commission Society is probably the biggest membership of any society for HIV, I would think, almost you know anywhere in the world, certainly in... in um, uh, resource limited settings, I think it is up there. And uh, we have this journal which is sent to every single one of the members. Um, and so when the the journal was uh, being sent out, we've actually cut back on, on everyone who receives journal, but there was sort of circulation of something like uh, 10,000 uh, every, every um, uh, time that there was a, a, a a journal um, drop, if you like. And the guidelines, therefore, are getting into every little clinic in every section of certainly the SADAC countries, the English-speaking sub-Saharan um, countries in, the, in Southern Africa. And um, so I'd like to think the guidelines have gone very wide. Anecdotally, on the ground, I hear a lot of positive feedback. Um, I do hear that clinicians enjoy uh, the sort of added information uh, that has opened minds to, um, to thought processes. And at the time when the guidelines were launched, we did quite a lot of dissemination type work. So Viv and I and other committee members went to a lot of conferences, um, committee workshops, etc., to to make sure that the guidelines were well known in this area. But I'm, uh, I'm sorry that I'm not able to give you uh, more specific numbers or indeed, sadly, to be able to tell you whether it really has changed practice on the ground. I think what we are seeing is this increasing recognition that's kind of building momentum. What I like to think is the guidelines have increased the momentum and maybe caused some ca catalyst to that. Um, but I think we're seeing an increasing awareness around this anyway because of numerous factors on the ground. Uh, so to, and I can quickly answer Elizabeth's question, where can we find these guidelines? They are available online uh, for the, the Journal uh, of HIV Medicine, the Southern African Journal of HIV Medicine. So if you type that into the URL, um, I can also in a moment just get the actual URL for you. But if you go to Google and do the Southern African H Journal of HIV Medicine, uh, and then Thank you, Linda Gale. I think your microphone has perhaps cut off right at the trail end of your comments, but you um, 
predicted the question uh, that we actually just got, which is where can we find these guidelines? So I hope that people did hear her response. And if you haven't, you can always email me after and I'll, I'll share the link with you. I think one of the great things about these guidelines, you know, being produced by a clinician society is that they might have a, a broader reach and applicability than, say, national guidelines drafted by one particular government in one country. I think guidelines like that are, are also useful because they become institutionalized within a country's health system. But I think, you know, having the guidelines that are drafted that are not particularly tied to one country, uh, you know, allows for potential broader, wider implementation of them. Um, uh, I'm going to turn uh, the floor over to Promise for a moment, who, who I think would like to make Yeah, I mean, thanks, uh, Professor Linda Gale. Uh, I mean, they sound powerful. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading them. Um, you know, but the question I have was, uh, what has been the, the level of recognition of this by by the government? Because I'm thinking that I mean, clinicians, you know, could be committed, uh, you know, but uh, if there are no resources or if this is not backed by government policy, um, clinicians will not be able to to implement them as such. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. That's, that's a great question. And I think it's actually a good follow-on to the comment that I made about them having potential broader applicability. But I think that the point that you raise is an important one that, you know, clinicians on their own operating in a country can't necessarily just choose to adopt new guidelines and they do need to be in line with the government structures. Um, unfortunately, it looks like um, Dr. Linda Gale is having some technical difficulties and, and she just dropped off. So she's signing back in and when she gets back in, um, we'll have her address that question. Um, we have a couple more questions coming in. I think, Promise, if you can stay on the line, uh, one for you is, what do you think women, um, individual women living with HIV can do when they're accessing health services to demand um, better care? So in settings where we know that coercive practices are going on, do you have any recommendations for, for women patients when they're um, visiting healthcare facilities for what they might be able to do to catalyze better services that respect their rights? Mm. Okay, do, do you want me to try and respond now? Yes, please. Um, I mean, obviously, there is no, you know, clear, you know, sort of uh, answer to, to that particular question, uh, you know. But for us, uh, the, the 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 starting point um, is, is creating awareness uh, of the rights um, and responsibilities of HIV-positive women, um, and we also, you know, feel that it has to be like a two-way, you know, street, so to speak, uh, you know, build capacity in the part of HIV-positive women but also build capacity, you know, on the side of healthcare workers, you know, to say, you know, we are introducing this program uh, and these are the rights, you know, of patients in relation to this particular, you know, issue. Uh, and this is how, you know, we think we can monitor the, the implementation and the efficacy of the program, but this is, you know, also how uh, we are going to monitor, you know, that we implement this uh, within the, the, the human rights uh, framework. Um, what has also worked for us, so where we've seen, you know, results in terms of women demanding services, is solidarity. Um, you know, if women with HIV with uh, one fate are able, you know, to stand together and say, this is what we want and this is how we want to be treated, you know, we've tended to see that positive results um, in, in that sphere as well. Um, and also, you know, the issue of, of political uh, commitment, you know, that um, healthcare workers are you know, in the end, um, accountable to politicians or to, to their leaders, you know, and if leaders are sort of uh, projecting messages uh, that are pro-HIV positive women, you know, messages that are pro the rights of HIV positive women, uh, healthcare providers are quite likely to, you know, want to respect what is being said to them. Yeah.
Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, we fortunately, just got Linda Gale back online. Um, we're going to see if her microphone will work. Um, I'll briefly try to, to articulate the question, Thomas, that you posed. Linda Gale, I hope, I hope that you can hear us. Um, Thomas actually asked a question about the guidelines um, that was complementary complementary to my own comment about the potential wider ability of the guidelines because they are not necessarily one government, but the perhaps challenges that raises for individual clinicians or programs in countries that would like to adopt those guidelines, but because they are not necessarily stemming from the government or might not be completely in line with government policy, how how you see that working. So do you have any any comments to share about about that issue of um, you know, clinicians wanting to take up the guidelines um, without them necessarily coming from the government. You know, I think um, Trisha and Promis and, and all, this, you know, this has been a long-standing um, kind of strategy that I guess we've used here, particularly during the denial years when the clinicians really um, needed to take up the, the calls and, and you know, take um, sort of take action. I think in in more recent years dur during the the new administration and when the Department of Health has been much more, um, if you like, on our side or we're on their side. I'm not sure which, but um, you know, I do think we are all swimming in the same direction. Uh, certainly in this country, South Africa, um, I think there is much more alignment of of um, of policy, and so what comes out of the clinician society actually does align with what the Department of Health is saying. So whilst these are not Department of Health guidelines, um, I do think that we, many of us, work in the public sector, and we have um, therefore penned them in such a way that they are applicable to public sector clinics. And so I, you know, if you read the guidelines as a practitioner working in the public sector, there is nothing that is not um, implementable uh, given the resources that are available today in this part of the world. So um, whilst I can see anxiety that not everybody is going to have access, say, to sperm washing or indeed to intrauterine insemination, there are still many things that can be done very practically on the ground. Um, but I do, I do hear this, uh, this, this is an ongoing refrain that Department of Health or health uh, generated guidelines do have better uptake. I, I do think um, that the guidelines that are put out by the clinicians are somewhat different in that regard and, and so I, I, I'm hoping that they are broader uh, and are available to anybody in the field to apply to their practice. Thank you so much, Linda Gale. I just want to actually ask if Eric Von Prague can resubmit his question that he typed in. Um, it, it appeared, and we were getting ready to, to make it the next question, and um, it has disappeared. So Eric, if you wouldn't mind please retyping that, we'd be happy to, to get that addressed for you. Um, Okay, well, while we're waiting for that to, to reappear, and Eric, I'm sorry for the technical difficulty there, um, I also wanted to, to ask Lisa to, um, to address any um, sort of future ongoing kind of research questions that you see for the scientific community um, to, to help maybe um, address some of the gaps that you, 
that you mentioned earlier that we have in our, our evidence base. So if you could briefly maybe share just one or two research questions that you think are particularly re relevant to the science. I guess I would say um, I think the issue of integration is really important. Um, the sort of I think it, it speaks to what Promos was talking about in terms of the continuum of services, you know, from you know adolescents reaching their you know exploring their sexuality and and whether they become you know they get married or not, and sort of the sexual and reproductive health approach that encompasses or takes on you know the the importance of healthy sexuality as well as reproductive health decision making um, so I think that those are um, important issues to think about and and also to think about what needs to happen at the systems level and the donor level to enable that to happen um, so I think that's one. And of course, the issue of stigma and discrimination is is is, is so big, um, and I think measuring that has proven to be, you know, difficult. Um, disc discrimination in terms of the law being easier in many ways than stigma, but um, I think those are all really um, important uh, important questions going forward. I agree. Um, thank you very much, Lisa. And we have um, Eric von Prague's question now back. And he's asking from uh, his experience in Tanzania, saying that many of the adherents and HIV prevention counselors do not have the skills or even more often the attitude to address fertility um, or contraception issues among discordant couples. And he's wondering, um, what is the experience and approaches from South Africa, if Linda Gale has any? Hi, Eric. Yeah, you know, we've, um, I, I agree. I think this is something that needs to be trained. Um, I think that one has to go out there with a toolkit and make sure that adherence counselors um, are given the skills to be able to do this. Um, and our own experience uh, locally has been a good one, that counsellors often, to address the stigma issue, we, we actually, quite a few of our counsellors have their jobs because they themselves live with HIV and sometimes they're the harshest critics, I have to say. There is, there's quite a, we, you know, we've had to re-sensitize our, our whole clinic staff um, thoughts around people's choices and the fact that they should be allowed to make their own choices independently but with all the knowledge uh, at their disposal so that they can make informed choices. And so really the, the bulk of the training has had to go in to the folk who spending the most time with the patients and that actually is the counsellors. And we have been able to train them to do certainly uh, intravaginal uh, insemination. This is not... Um, this is a fairly easy uh, thing to teach and in fact you can even teach the patients themselves to do it themselves. Um, so you know it, it needs uh, somebody who's just prepared to kind of take the bull by the horns, get themselves either a, a, um, a syringe that doesn't have a pointy top to it or a turkey baster or whatever it is that you yourself want to um, use or that is acceptable in, in, the, in the clinics where you work and there's quite a lot of cultural uh, sensitivity around this so one, one needs to do it carefully and with lots of uh, consultation but we have certainly been able to train um, counsellors to teach patients, patients to teach other patients and um, actually to develop the skills on hand. Some of the difficult, again, cultural issues are around um, collecting semen, uh, you know, for, for a practice such as this. And again, you need to be sensitive to your community and what some of the feelings are on the ground about this. Uh, people don't necessarily easily do this. And so, you know, that's where we found that it's actually more about consultation than actually just transferring the skills. The skills themselves are, are relatively easy to do. 
And, and then, as I say, a lot of the work goes more into reformulating people's um, prejudices and attitudes about this, uh, this whole approach, which needs time and patience and a, a great deal of trust and, and input. So I, I do think that it's, um, it can be done. It needs time and, and energy. Okay, thank you so much, Linda Gale. And I just I want to um, begin to wrap up our session today. I would like to thank all of our speakers very much for devoting their time and sharing their expertise with us on this topic. Um, I think it's one that has generated a lot of interest among um, people uh, across the spectrum, whether they're providers or um, healthcare managers, policy makers, women living with HIV researchers and, and, and other folks. So I just want to thank you for, for your comments and perspectives and just wrap up by letting people know that the webinar was recorded today and it will be soon available online. Um, for anyone who wasn't able to make the live session today, people can access it online. You will be able to find it on FHI 360's YouTube channel. If you have any questions or comments that you didn't get to share today, please feel free to email me at the address you see on your screen. Um, I think you know today's discussion was, was really rich, and I think um, we've um, addressed some of the challenges with regard to fully respecting the sexual and reproductive health rights of women and couples with HIV, whether they'd like to prevent or plan pregnancy. Uh, some of those challenges stemming from discrimination and negative attitudes from healthcare providers, but I think also just a general lack of knowledge or capacity um, from providers and within the overall health system to really to really meet the needs of women and couples with HIV. But I think that some of our experts today have shared some progress we're making in this regard, um, both in expanding the evidence base hopefully in strengthening the dialogue that takes place between decision makers and women and communities living with HIV. And then also on the service delivery side, some, you know, some tools and resources like the conception guidelines that, that are um, being developed and, and implemented. So thank you to everyone for your time today. And I look forward to hopefully continuing this conversation. In thank follow. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all. Thank you.